All right, so I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with some questions for you. And these are not Flickr questions because we don't have Flickr, Flickrs yet. But please talk to a person next to you and then think about answering these questions. So here is question number one. Suppose you have some charge plus Q here and another charge which is exactly equal in magnitude and equal in sign also, plus Q, and they are both at the same distance, let's say one centimeter from some origin. And here you have another charge which is minus Q. The question that I have for you is, what is going to be the direction of the force on this charge minus Q? This is not Q, <coughs> this is minus Q. So, what is the direction? A force, and this force that we are talking about is electrostatic force. On charge minus Q. This is your question. Please take half a minute or one minute to talk to the person next to you because you remember that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. And also from Coulomb's law, you know what the magnitude of force is and what is the direction of each of the forces, right? So the force that the charge minus Q is feeling is due to this and this charge. So now you figure out what would be the direction of the net force. Please talk to a person next to you. Everybody should be talking. So let's call it, you know, a force in this direction and let's give it a name F1. So F1 is a force that's acting this way. And notice that I'm only drawing the force on the charge that we are asked to find the force on. It's true that this charge is also feeling a force towards that and that is attractive when <coughs> it's hit, but I do not, you know, want to bother with that one because the question is asking me about this charge. I keep mentioning this because many people get confused about the direction of force because they keep thinking, am I trying to find the force on this charge or this charge? This time we are asked to find the force on minus Q, so that's what we are going to focus on. Similarly, the force on minus Q to this charge is going to be along the line joining these two charges, and it's going to be again an attractive force towards that. So does everybody see that this force is also going to be, is going to be like this? Let's give it a name F2. Right? Does everybody see that forces F1 and F2 must have the same magnitude? Because remember, Coulomb's law is this, right? Coulomb's law says that the force between two charges has a magnitude which will be K Q1 Q2 divided by R squared, where R is the distance between the two charges, and Q1 and Q2 are the magnitudes of the two charges, and this K is a constant. Right? So in this case, if this charge and this charge, the product of the char these two charges is going to be Q squared, is this, this distance is exactly the same as this distance, right? And do you see if this charge and this charge are equal magnitude, do you see that F2 will have a magnitude here, K, Q squared. 
square divided by whatever is this distance. Let, let's give this distance a name R. Right? <coughs> so this is R squared. And similarly, this F1 will have exactly the same magnitude, right? This is also K Q squared over R squared. So you can see that in this case, the forces are exactly equal in magnitude. They, they are. At this point, we can resolve these forces into components. So if suppose I choose this as my x-axis and this as my y-axis, do you see that this force, so basically we have two forces here. If I draw the free body diagram of minus q, I have two forces. One is like this, we get plotting in F1. And this can be broken into what components? Can anybody tell me how to break this into components? Do you see that in order to break this into components, you should have one component like this and the other component like this. So we, we can call this thing F1x, and this is F1y, right? Because remember how vectors are broken into two perpendicular components? They should be head to tail, and that the resultant is going to be from this tail to this tail, <coughs> like this, along the hypotenuse, right? Similarly, for this force F2, which is like this, we can break it into components. One will be like this. This will be F2x. This will be F2y. And again, are you seeing that in these two cases, since F1 and F2 have the same magnitude, is everybody agreeing that this one, F1x and F1, F2x, will cancel each other out? Because they are going to be equal magnitude and they are pointing in opposite directions and hence the only net force is going to be <coughs> along the y direction and the net force magnitude f magnitude will be f1y plus f2y and this is going to be you know in the negative y direction that's the direction Right? Can you also find the magnitude or not? Yeah, suppose I told you that this thing is also one, one centimeter. So let's try to find the magnitude also. Magnitude of this force. Suppose I told you this is one centimeter as well. If that's one centimeter also, is it easy to find R? What is it? Yeah, you can see that this is a right angle triangle here. This is one centimeter. This is one centimeter. So the hypotenuse R here is going to be square root of 1 centimeter square plus 1 centimeter square, which is equal to square root of 2 centimeters, right? Okay. Also, we need to, we'll need to figure out what this angle is. Do you think we can figure <coughs> out these angles? First of all, they are the same angle. So if we call this thing, say, theta, then this one will be theta also. This is theta. So tell me, how can we figure out what this angle is? Hmm? Yeah, it is 45 degrees, and how can we figure out? Because look, first of all, if this is one centimeter and this is one, is, is, this, is this angle the same as this angle? Yeah, it is. You can see what I have done is I have actually looked at a line like this, and I'm calling this angle theta. If that is theta, you can see this must be theta also. Why? Because I know that if two parallel lines intersect each other, then if this is theta, this must be theta also. Right? And if that's the case, you can see here that tangent of theta is 1 centimeter divided by 1 centimeter. Right? And that means theta must be tangent inverse 1, which will be 45 degrees. So you can tell that this angle is 45 degrees. That means this is 45 degrees. Right? So then can anybody tell me how to find the net force then? Because we are saying the net force is F1y plus F2y magnitude. And this is two times, if you like, F1y. Because each of these has the same magnitude. <coughs> and what is this equal to? So that, that will be equal to, let me write it here, so then f will be 2 times f1y 
and this is equal to 2 times K Q1, Q2, all of the charges are equal, so that's Q squared divided by R squared times what? What, what would be the, is Y component sine theta or cosine theta? Look here. Remember, the adjacent thing is the cosine theta, right? So F1x will be F1 times cosine theta. F1y will be F1 times sine theta. Is everybody remembering that? Okay. So then, this will be sine theta. F1y will be F1. This is F1. This whole thing is F1. <coughs> right? Okay, so at this point, it's all a matter of plugging in the numbers, so I'm not going to do it. You know what is the distance between the charges. Suppose I told you what was the magnitude of all of those charges. Let's say they were 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs. You put those numbers, theta is 45 degrees. You can calculate the force in Newton. Right, the force will be Newton. And the direction we already found is negative by direction. We just said, in fact, all of you found that the force was downward. Any questions about this? Okay, let's try to do one other quick question with you before we move on. So how about this situation? Suppose you have a charge plus Q here. You have another charge, which is also plus Q here, which is at, say, a one, a one centimeter distance. And you have another charge, which is minus Q. They are all in the same straight line. The magnitude of all these charges are this, this, the same. But you can see two of them are positive, one of them is negative. The question is, what is the direction of net force on this? <coughs> Q1 is this one, due to the other two. Please talk to a person next to you, half a minute. <coughs> <coughs> go to the left because the closer positive charge would repel it more than the negative would attract it. So you're saying net force will be this way? Yeah. How many people agree with him? <coughs> okay, excellent. That is absolutely correct because again, we should be drawing the free body diagram of this, right? If you draw the free body diagram of this, you can see there will be two forces. One will be repulsive force due to this, right? The other will be the attractive force due to that. And so you can see that this resultant force will be the vector sum. So if I draw a free body diagram of this charge, Q1, I will see that there is a force, if I call this thing Q2, and if I call this thing Q3, what I will see is that there is a repulsion here due to this charge Q2, and the force I can call F12. Then there is an attraction here. So charge 1 is attracted to charge 3, and that's the force that charge 1 is feeling due to 3, which is that way. And if you want, I can draw this arrow a little longer so that you can see attraction is more because this distance is smaller. And you can see the distance does factor in to Coulomb's law, right? And so you can see that if I try to find F net here, or F, the magnitude of this is going to be, again, F13, if this is my x axis. <coughs> call it F1 plus F13 minus F12. And you can see that this will be a negative number. And that means that the direction X force must be this way. Right? Is everybody agreeing that the net force will be that way? Because if you add these two things, like to, uh, take the magnitude of this, take the magnitude of this, you already told me this magnitude is more, so <coughs> this thing will turn out to be negative. Can you figure out the magnitudes also? The magnitude of the net force? Yes. Just use Coulomb's law, kq square over r12 square, 
and R13 squared, right? <coughs> and you can work it out. Any questions about this? Okay, then let's really try to do one problem, one quantitative problem from the beginning to the end because all of your homework problems this week that are quantitative relate to this kind of thing. That's what chapter one is all about. So let me try to do one problem with you. Completely. Let's say that we have three charges. Let's say here is one charge. And let's say this charge is what we are calling Q1 and it's positive and it is 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs. Here is another charge which is a positive charge and this is Q2 and this is 2 times 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs. And then there is another charge over here and that's negative. And this is Q3 which is minus 4 times 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs. This is the, this is Q3. These two charges are positive. This is negative. And the question is saying, find the net force on Q2. Okay. So again, what should be the procedure? By the way, we are given that each of these distances is one centimeter. Let's say this is one centimeter and this is one centimeter. Should we draw a free body diagram for Q2? We should, yeah. So which way will be the force on Q2 due to Q1? Repulsive. So there will be a force like this and let's give it a name F. Two, one. This is the force on two, <coughs> and it's a repulsive force. Which way will be the force on Q two due to Q three? Somebody from the front row. Very good. It'll be attractive, and remember, it's always going to be along the line joining the two charges, right? That's what Coulomb's law says. Isn't that true? So if it's an attractive force, this charge Q two will be attracted towards Q three. So that's going to be like this, and I'm going to give this force a name F2, 3, just to remind me that this is the force on 2 due to 3. And that's it. At this point, all I have to do is get back to how to add these vectors, you know, using the method you have learned in physics 1, right? Chapter 1, remember? So basically, we have to add these two vectors. Now, I do need to know what this angle here is. Do I know that angle? Yeah, again, if this is 1 centimeter and this is 1 centimeter, 45. Yeah, we can again use exactly the same reasoning as here, and we can see that this angle must be 45 degrees. <coughs> right? So, at this point, if I choose my coordinate axis, and a very convenient axis here will be choosing this as x and this as y, it doesn't really matter. If somebody wants to choose this as the positive x direction, that's fine too. Then you can say, oh, my force is pointing, you know, because your answer should always be in terms of the axis that you choose, right? So let's work through this thing and see what we are doing. So first of all, we should resolve. So here is my free body diagram. One, it's showing there is a force F21, which is pointing like this, and there is another force like this. This is my Q2, and there's another force which is F23, which is acting at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to my negative x-axis. Okay, so let's resolve F23 into X and Y components. Again, exactly in the manner that we resolved this force, F1 into F1X and F1Y, but F2 into F2X and F2Y, we can do exactly the same kind of thing here, and we can see that this force, F23, can be resolved into a force F23 X, right? And what would be the force, what would be F23 X? There will be an F23 Y, sorry, this is Q2, this is F23 Y, and this is your, let me just <coughs> a dash line to see, to show you that this is the resultant, F23. 
And then I still have this thing, this force F21. What are the magnitudes of F23x and F23y? Anybody? If this angle is 45 degrees, F23x has a magnitude of what? Yeah, F23 times what? Cosine? Yeah, cosine theta or cosine 45. And F23y will be F23 times sine 45 or sine theta. Okay, good. So let's now try to figure out what is the net force. And remember, force is a vector. So you have to talk about both magnitude and direction. If you want to get full points, you must say what is the magnitude of force and which direction is the force pointing. So now that we have straightened these things out, let's say that F net is my net force. So what is the x component of F net x? Very good. It will be F21 minus F23x. Right? And what is this? So this will be equal to F21. What is F21? Can you tell me what it will be? <coughs> K, from Coulomb's law, again, it will be K, F21 magnitude. Q2 magnitude divided by the distance between 1 and 2 squared. Let's give it a name R12. Okay, what is F23x? We already said F23x is going to be F23 times cosine theta. Right? So this is going to be minus K2 and 3. So I have Q2, Q3 divided by the distance between 2 and 3 squared times since it's the x component, which is cosine theta, this is times cosine theta here. Okay, at this point, all you need to do is plug in the values of different things. Do we know what is R2, R12 is, and do we know what is R23 is? What are they? Tell me. Tell me what is R12. This is the distance between? 1 and 2, and that should be in this picture, R12, we can see, is this distance. So that will be 1 centimeter. This is my R12. Okay, what about R, R23? That's this, right? If that is the distance, do we know how to find it? Yeah, again, it's 1 centimeter square plus 1 centimeter square square root will be square root 2 centimeter. So basically, this distance here is my R23. And that distance, as you can see, will be equal to square root 2 centimeter. Is everybody with me? OK. Basically, then, we know that R12 is 1 centimeter, and R Two, three is square root 2 centimeter. So I'm not going to plug in the values, but you know the value of k. k is 9 times 10 to the power 9 in the SI system of units. So 9 times 10 to the power 9 Newton meter square over Coulomb square. That's the k from <coughs> constant. k is a universal constant, remember? So this is 9 times 10 to the power 9. It doesn't change. Newton meter square per Coulomb square. So put the value of k, q1 and q2, all of the charges are given to you. Notice everything is magnitude, right? Is everybody agreeing with that? That q3, you will put the value as 4 times 10 power minus 6 Coulomb because you're looking at the magnitude. All the signs have already been taken into account when you drew the free body diagram. Theta is 45 degrees, R23, R12, everything we know, we can plug in the value and we can find what is F net X. You can plug in the values at home. Similarly, can we find F net Y? Tell me what it will be. There's only one Y component, right? And so this is just equal to, sorry, F net Y is just equal to F23Y, and this is just equal to F23. <coughs> Times. 
times. Um, thank you. This is signed here. Very good. Right? And again, we know what is F23. So we just wrote this down. This is just K, Q2 magnitude, Q3 magnitude, divided by R squared. Right? Times I think. This is my F net Y. Uh, one thing I wanted uh, you to uh, wanted you to notice that this sign is positive here because this is pointing in the positive y direction, right? Okay, so now that you found f net x and f net y, can you find f net? Yeah, you can find f net, and you can say, oh, what about the magnitude of f net? Magnitude of f net is going to be square root of x squared plus f net y squared, right? And what about the direction? You know, direction is given by theta is equal to, from, uh, remember, the <coughs> tangent of theta is f y divided by f x, right? So theta will be tangent inverse of f y over fx. Is that right? Is everybody comfortable with this? Now one thing that I want to say is that you do have to put in the values for, to figure out which way f net x is. Do you see that because there are two things here and I haven't plugged in the values here. Let's think about two different cases. Suppose this number turned out to be more than this, right? If suppose you did, you plugged in the number and this number turned out to be more than this number, I'm just trying to do two different cases. Then f net x will be pointing which way, positive x or negative x? Then it will be positive x. So if, if f net x is like this, <coughs> right? And of course f net y for us is only positive, so if f net y is like this, You know one thing that we didn't do well? Should we have called it, it was better to call it Harriet than theta, right? Isn't that confusing? Because we use the theta for another angle there. So either we call it another angle, let's say phi, or even Georgina would be a better name because we <coughs> confuse two different angles, right? Is everybody seeing? Because here we are talking about this angle that the net force is making with the x-axis, and we shouldn't be calling this the same as some other angle that we call theta there, right? Our name shouldn't be overlapping. If there are five things that are called the same, you wouldn't know which thing we are talking about. Okay, so let's call it phi. So in this case, this angle phi, how would I say? This is the angle, you put the value of f y that you found here, f net y. By the way, this is f net y. This is f net x. Once you work this out, you will say in this case, hey, phi is the angle what? Above the positive x-axis. Do you see that? So this is the angle. <coughs> and maybe when you do the tangent inverse and plug in the number, this might turn out to be 63 degrees or 68 degrees or 34 degrees. This will be angle, this, this angle above positive x-axis. Okay, what if what if the calculation was different and what if we had this? What if it turned out that when you plug in the value of q1, q3, r1, 2, r1, 3, cosine theta, etc., and we could do it, but I just don't want to spend the time. Suppose this thing turned out to be negative. Okay? So in that case, do you see that my picture would look like this? So if f net x was negative, then it would be like this, right? f net y is always positive anyway in our problem because there was only one term. Then my net force, f net would be pointing this way at the angle phi, right? And then I would have said everything will be still this, everything will still be the same. All of these calculations are good. This is good. This is good. Just that you will write
right here, this is the angle above what? Negative x-axis. So all the calculations will carry through, except you will say, why is the angle above? Right? So you should be very clear about what you're talking about, because the DA will have no way of telling otherwise which angle phi you're talking about. So there should be a picture that should show what you're talking about. And you can see that if f net x is in the positive x direction, then this angle that you calculated will be above the positive x axis. If it turns out to be negative, then this is the angle above the negative x axis. Otherwise, these two numbers are going to be exactly the same in either case. <coughs> right? So long as your f net x and f net y are the same, have the same value. So this one suppose turned out to be, you know, who knows, 3 Newton, and this is 5 Newton. Suppose this is, you know, 3 Newton in the negative x direction, this is 5 Newton this way. I'm saying angle phi and f net are the same, except for this difference in the angle, the direction of the angle. Any questions, folks? Anybody? All right, so the last thing that I wanted to say in this chapter is just two points that I want to emphasize, a few points I want to emphasize here. One thing is, remember we already talked about the fact that the charge is going to be a multiple of the charge on the electron or a proton. And so you can say that charge is quantized. And the word quantized means that it is discrete. So charge is always going to be a multiple of the charge of the electron, electronic charge or the proton charge, which is the same. The charge on an electron or proton have the same magnitude, just that the signs are opposite. So one idea is so these are just some things we want to summarize before we move on. So one is charges. <coughs> Quantized means it's discrete, discontinuous. It changes in discontinuous norm. So it's basically total charge on something. By total charge, I mean total net charge <coughs> on an object. Say, for example, on this chalk or this eraser. Q will be equal to N times the charge of an electron or proton. So this E here is 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. This is the magnitude of charge on an electron or proton. n is number of them. Is that making sense? So you wouldn't find that this chalk will have a charge of 1.5 times this. It will either be 1 times this, or 2 times this, or 3 times this, or 4 times this, <coughs> or n times this. Does that make sense? Not something in between? Because the charges are really due to the charge of the electron and proton, which is a discrete number. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize is that charges, the total charge in this universe is conserved. If you add up all the positive and negative charges, it adds up to the same value all the time. So the total charge is conserved. So that means if you, as I said, adding up the positive and negative charges in the universe will always give you the same value. It is true that in some processes that take place, it is possible that something that does not have charge, for example, a photon. Photon is a particle of light you know, that does not have a charge in it. Or it doesn't have a net charge. It, it, it is possible that for a photon in certain reactions to break into two charged particles, but those two charged particles will always have charges which are exactly equal and opposite. 
so that the net charge in the universe is not changing. Do you see what I'm saying? So, if the universe started with a certain amount of total charge, it remains the same all the time. Okay, this is a good thing to know. Conserve means it does not change. Okay, the third thing that you should notice is the fact that Coulomb's law is very similar to something that you've learned in physics one. Which law does it look very similar to in its? Yeah, Newton's law of gravitation. Do you, do you see? So the third point that I wanted to make is Coulomb's law analogy Newton's law of gravitation so the thing is what is Coulomb's law we already said you know in vector form we can write it like this f is equal to k q1 q2 divided by r squared and it's along the vector r hat so this r hat vector is a unit vector along the line joining the two charges <coughs> What was, this is the Coulomb's law, so this is the force between charges, and the gravitational force between two masses was a gravitational constant, G, which is also a universal constant, just like this constant, K, times masses, the product of the two masses, M1 over M2, divided by the distance between the two masses squared, times this vector r hat. So again, it's along the line joining the two masses. So if you have some mass m1 here, and here is another mass m2, they are a distance r apart, then this will be the gravitational force. If you have two charges, q1 and q2, and they are a distance r apart, this will be the Coulomb force. Now, there is one difference. So you can see that both of these forces are 1 over r square forces, right? Inverse square forces. So as you go, if suppose here is a mass and here is another mass, these two masses are always doing what? Are they always attracted to each other? Yeah, that's one major difference that gravitational force is always attracted. These two forces are always like this. So F12 and F21. Of course, they are going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. In this case, it's always attractive. In this case, it depends upon the sign of the charges. So if both of them are positive, then this one is repelled, and this one is repelled. Of course, the magnitudes are equal. If one of them turned out to be positive, plus Q1, and the other one turned out to be negative, Q2, in this case, these things will attract. So this one will be like this, and this one will be the other way. So from Newton's third law, they'll always be pointing in opposite directions, there's no doubt. So if this one's pointing to the uh, right, this one will be pointing to the left. But notice that this force could be attractive or repulsive, whereas gravitational <coughs> force is always attractive. However, both of them are inverse square laws. Here, it depends upon the product of the masses, the magnitude. And here it depends upon the product of the charges, right? And the force always acts along the line joining the two masses or along the line joining the two charges. Any questions for, for folks? Anybody? All right, then let's move on to chapter two now. And this is again continuing our discussion of electrostatics. <laughs> so we are assuming right now we are talking about charges at rest. We are not going to talk, so, uh, to, you know, for the next few chapters, we are not going to talk about charges in motion. Because do you know what charges in motion produce? Hmm? Yeah, they produce current, what is called current, right? When charges are in motion, we say, oh, a current is flowing or something. But that is not something we are going to talk about for the next five, six chapters. So right now, we are going to focus on what, what is the force between charges? What are the fields produced by charges when they are at rest? And that's why this study is called electrostatics. Static means rest. All right. Okay, so 
Now, remember I already mentioned this word to you, but I said I'm not going to explain it till we get to the next chapter, the word called electric field. When we are talking about a conductor, I told you that in a conductor, the charges will always distribute themselves in such a way that the electric field inside the conductor stays zero. Remember I told you? In the conductor, everywhere it remains zero. The thing is, what is this electric field? So let's start talking about something called electric field. And that's the whole chapter about this whole chapter. So why do we need this new word? First of all, you, you can say, oh, didn't we all talk about forces? I understand everything. Why should you use a new word called force, a uh, field, electric field? I already understand electric force. Electric force is given by the Coulomb's law between two charges. And if I have many charges, I can use superposition principle like we did in this problem and find the force on any charge due to all the other ones. We'll see what is the advantage of using the field. First of all, even conceptually, the idea of field is very appealing because if suppose, if suppose we were looking at, say, the problem that I we, we worked on here, let's look at this problem here. One question that should come to your mind, which is very nagging, is, okay, so if there is a charge Q2, it is not touching the class charge Q1, it's not touching the charge Q3, how does it know that there are these charges so that it feels a force this way or it gets you know, attracted towards that? You know, these charges are not touching. Somehow there seems to be this action at a distance. They feel each other's influence, force, even without touching each other. So one way to justify this is to say, oh, maybe each of these charges is setting up this field around it, something that you know, if you put another charge in that field, it will, you know, that charge will feel the influence of this charge because it's, it's, because this other charge is in its field. Similarly, this charge will produce some field around it and if this charge is in its field, it will feel the force due to it. You know, so the same idea can also apply to gravitational forces also. How is it that if this is one galaxy and this is another galaxy, how is it that those two galaxies are feel, feeling each other's force even though they are not touching each other? Again, you can say, oh, each mass is setting up a gra gravitational field around it. This one is setting up a gravitational field around it. And of course, you can expect that as you go away from the mass, the field will decrease. Right? <coughs> the influence will get weaker and weaker. So if these two masses were closer, then this mass will feel a larger effect due to the field produced by this. Similarly, this mass will feel a larger effect produced by this if they, they were closer. But this idea of field justifies why there is an action at a distance. You don't need to be, the two masses don't need, don't need to be touching each other. The two charges don't need to be touching each other. Okay? Now, what, what good is it? Why should we actually use this idea of field? Think about it this way, you know, and think about how much simpler your life would be if suppose I just didn't tell you what was the charge here in this problem that we were discussing, but suppose what we could do is we could figure out what is the field that is produced at this point by this charge and this charge. Suppose we could figure that out, you know, and I could tell you that now in order to find a force on some charge that you bring there, all you have to do is use this relation because the quantitative way that a field is defined is like this. Let me write it down for you. And you will see the virtue of this new idea. So we are now talking about electric field. And we are going, this is obviously a vector. Field is a vector. And we are going to denote it with a symbol E. And it turns out that electric field is related to force that some point charge Q0 will feel like this. So this is the relation between force and field. So this is the force on a point charge Q0, let's call it Q0, placed at at the location where we want to find the field.
So what I'm trying to say is that these two charges, minus 4 times 10 to the minus 6 Coulomb and plus Q1 times 10 to the minus 6 Coulomb, in this example, will set up a field here, 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 everywhere in space, right? including this point that I am interested right now. We are all interested at this point, although the field will be set up by these charges everywhere. Now, <coughs> if I wanted to know the force on some charge, and I could tell you, oh, this charge Q2 is 2 times 10 to the power minus 6 Coulomb, if you had to find force, one way to do it will be to go through what I told you, right? Suppose if I, cha I change my mind and I said, no, actually, I'm going to bring a different charge 4 times 10 power minus 6 Coulomb. What will you do? Will you redo this whole calculation if you didn't know about field? Will you? You would. The only thing that I've changed in this problem is from the original problem here, I change this to 4. Suppose if I change this to 8. What will you do? Will you redo this calculation if you didn't know about field? Yeah, you will redo the calculation with this new, new thing. If I change this to minus 8, Nice and for minus 6 Coulomb. Again, you'll have to redo the calculation. Do you see? Every time you need to find the force, if the question was still saying, find the force on Q2, you'll say, oh my gosh, this is a new charge. Let me toil through this work again. Hey, the good thing about finding the field, if suppose we could find what is the field at this point due to this charge and due to this charge, all we need to do is to find the force on any charge Q2 that you place there is multiplied at Q2 by the electric field there. You do the calculation of field one time, at this point, it's a simple job. All you have to say is, I can give you the force very easily just by multiplying the field that I have calculated here due to these two charges by one number, whatever you give me. Do you see how much easier this is? Because you don't have to keep repeating the same calculation over and over again. If you know the field produced by these three charges at this point in space, whatever charge you place there, 1 Coulomb, 2 Coulomb, minus 3 Coulomb, minus 5 Coulomb, all you have to do is multiply that field you have already calculated with these charges with the charge you bring there, and you're set. You found the force <coughs> that that charge will feel due to all these other charges. It's, so you can see calculation of field at a point due to some charges makes your calculation very easy. You don't have to repeat the same thing millions of times, right? Do you see the virtue of the idea of field? And what do you think should be the unit of electric field before we move on? Looking at this, can you tell me the unit? From here, you can see electric field can be written as force per unit charge that is placed at that point, right? This is how we are defining the electric field. Electric field is a vector which is the force per unit charge. So if you placed a charge which is 1 Coulomb at this point, the force on that will be, you know, electric field, whatever electric field you found, found that many newtons. But what is the unit of electric field itself? Can you tell me, looking at this? The unit of electric field from dimensional analysis should be the unit of force divided by the unit of charge, which is Newton per Coulomb, right? So do you see that the SI unit of electric field should be Newton per Coulomb? So electric field and electric force are not, not the same thing. They don't even have the same unit. But they are related to each other by <coughs> relation. So, if you know the electric field, you can find the force easily on any charge that you bring at that point, like our charge Q2 there, right? Also, just like the idea of superposition principle applies to force, do you think it will apply to electric field also? Yeah, it should. So, for example, if I didn't have one charge, suppose I had many charges, you can easily see from here, That if suppose I have some charge Q1, and then I have some charge Q2, and then I have some charge minus Q3, etc., 
you know, minus Q4. If I had to find what is the force that this that this, this charge feels due to these ones, then I'll say, oh, the force on F1, Q1 is going, going to be this way. This is the force that I call F12. It's repulsive. This force is attractive here. And this is the force on F1, on charge 1 due to 3. The force on charge 1 due to 4 is going to be this way. This is my F14, etc. And what we had said earlier is that the net force on 1, F1, should be, you know, a pairwise vector sum. This is the superposition principle, right? Superposition principle says this should be F13 plus F14 plus F15, etc. Right? By the way, notice that I'm not adding them up, I'm vectorially adding them. Pairwise. So this is the superposition principle for forces. And so what do you think it will give us for this case? Do you see that then uh, my net electric field can, can be written as, you know, F12 plus F13. We're trying to find the net electric field at the location of charge 1. Etc. divided by the charge on Q1, right? If I were trying to find what is the net electric field here, okay? What is B here at this location where charge Q1 is? By the way, you will not consider the electric field produced by Q1 itself at its, at its location. You will consider the electric field produced by all of the other charges. Does that make sense? Okay. Because, because the thing is, the force on that charge is due to all of the other charges, not due to itself. You see what I'm saying? The charge is not exerting, Q1 is not exerting a force on itself. So when you try to find the force on Q1, that will be due to Q2, Q3, and Q4, and not due to itself. Right? Okay. So this is what it is, and that means E can be written as, if you like, F12 over Q1 plus F13 over Q2 plus F14 over, sorry, this is again Q1, F14 over Q1, etc. And what is this? Is everybody seeing that we can call this term? What is this term? What can we call this term? Can we call it the electric field at the location of charge 1 due to produced by 2 electric field at the location? Then this one can be called, this whole thing can be called E13, this whole thing can be called E14, etc. Okay, so then I think we have proved to ourselves that we can use the superposition principle for electric field also. So what we have convinced ourselves <coughs> is this. <coughs> We have convinced ourselves that this thing can be written as E is equal to E12 plus E13 plus E14 plus E15, etc. So, what is the meaning of this? This is the net electric field, which is the vector sum of the electric field at location of charge 1 due to 2. Due to, uh, at the location of charge 1 due to 3, at the location of charge 1 due to 4, at the location of charge 1 due to 5, etc. So the electric field is being produced at that point where we are going to put some charge Q1 by all of these other charges. And we can just use a vector sum. This is the superposition principle for fields. Right? Okay, so if this is the case, let's now try to do some problems. So the first thing that we are going to do is figure out what is the electric field produced by one single point charge? So let's not worry about lots of charges, let's just worry about one. Okay? So the first thing we are going to do is the electric field produced by a point charge at a distance r away from the charge. point charge at a distance 
far away from it. Producing some field, right? First of all, we already said <coughs> the electric field tells you about the influence of this charge in the region around it. Do you think the influence will be stronger here than here? And here it will be stronger than here? So as you go farther away from the charge, you expect that the influence will fall off. So the field produced by this charge is going to fall off as you go farther away. The other thing that you can probably expect again is that if this charge has a smaller magnitude, if suppose this was a charge which was 10 power minus 6 coulomb, as opposed to say 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, do you expect that the weaker charge will have less field around it at the same distance away? You would, right? So those things we can already expect some of the answers, but let's try to figure out how do we find it. First of all, so I want to know what is the field at this point at a distance r away. And since electric field is a vector quantity, I must know both things. I must know the magnitude of the field, and I must know the direction of the field. Now, the thing that will help us all the time is this relationship. Because how do you know what is the field produced by a charge? Hey, it's not that difficult, because what we can do is we can actually bring some <coughs> charge that we call test charge. So, you know, we can bring some charge, and we can even imagine it in our head head, so we can call it a hypothetical test charge. We can think about bringing some charge Q0 here, even though there is no charge here. But in order to talk about what is the field that is produced by some charges on this chart at this point, you do not need to have a charge at this point. The field is being produced by this charge here. <coughs> it's, it's producing field everywhere around it. So we do not need to have a charge here in order to talk about what is the field that the charge is producing here, or here, or here, or here, okay? But the question is, how do you know the field? The thing that you measure will be force, right? So one way to do is to bring a th hypothetical test charge. And typically, we should make this charge a small charge so that it doesn't influence anything that is going on. So let's call this thing a test charge. Something that we can do in our heads. Right now, I'm making it positive. It doesn't matter. I'll show you with a negative charge also, we can find the direction of the field very easily. So the point is, you have asked me, what question are we first trying to answer? We are trying to answer this question. What would be the direction of the field produced by this charge Q at this location? And then we will tackle the question of what is its magnitude. Okay? And I'm saying one trick we can use is to bring some charge at this location. And if we bring, let's say, a positive test charge at this location, which way will the force be on this positive test charge due to this positive charge? Somebody from the second row here. Which way will this test charge that you brought there to test the direction of the electric field be due to this charge? Hmm? Yeah, do you see that it will be along the line during the two charges from Coulomb's law? So is everybody admitting that the force on this Q0 due to this charge will be that way? It will be, right? Is everybody agreeing? Now, here is the thing. If this charge is positive, which I told you it is, I brought a positive test charge, will the direction of electric field and force be the same? Look at this formula here. If this is, charge is not a vector, charge is a scalar quantity. Just that it can be negative or positive. Just like temperature can be positive or negative, but temperature doesn't pound point 30 degrees <coughs> south of west or 60 degrees north of something. You know, vector quantities are things that will definitely have direction. You can say this thing is pointing 39 degrees south of west or 32 degrees this or that. If you cannot do that, these things are scalar. You can, you can tell that just because things are positive or negative doesn't mean that they are vectors, right? We know temperature is a scalar. Similarly, charge is a scalar, even though it can be positive or negative. Work is a scalar, even though it can be positive or negative, because you don't say the work is pointing 35 degrees south of us. That would be really silly things to, thing to say, right? 
So in this particular case then, what do you think will be the direction of the electric field at this point produced by this charge? <coughs> Very good. Same as the direction of force. Force and field point in the same direction if the test charge is positive. Do you see? They are proportional to each other. With a, so in this case, is everybody agreeing that the electric field produced by this charge at this location will be pointing this way? Right? Okay, now we can get rid of our test charge. We can get rid of the direction of force. <coughs> it's just a trick we were using. What we really wanted to know is which direction is the electric field produced by this charge at this location. And now we know the direction of electric field is that way. Is that making sense? Similarly, I want you guys to tell me what would be the direction of the electric field here produced by this charge, and what would be the direction of electric field over here produced by this charge. Again, think in your head about bringing a test charge, and you should be able to do it. Please talk to a person next to you. Everybody should be bringing test charge, charges at those points. And these are just tricks. Think about which way is the test charge feeling the force. And the direction of force and field will be the same if your test charge is positive. Work with the person next to you, please. This time I'm going to catch a particular person. Everybody should be thinking. No, your test charge is some very small charge. Some very small charge that's just brought in your head. It's not even a real charge, it's a hypothetical thing. That you bring there, that's the electric field. You see? So no, it doesn't have to be equal to that. It's literally very small. That's how it is. All right, somebody from the third row here. Tell me, how did you figure out what was the direction of the electric field at this point due to produced by this charge? Notice there doesn't have to be any charge here. This is like saying, okay, my chalk is here, and chalk has some charge plus Q on it, which is a point <coughs> here. What is the electric field produced by this, the charge on the chalk at this location? Somebody here from the third row, please go ahead. How would you do it? We already said to bring a test charge, charge, right? So we should bring up in our head, we should imagine bringing, say, let's say, some positive test charge, very small charge. It's just for testing. It's for figuring out what would be the direction of field. It could even be in your head. This is not a, not. This doesn't have to be even real. You know, just we are trying to think what will happen in a real experiment. You would really put a test charge to figure out what would be the direction of the force. So then, what do you do? Right, we know from Coulomb's law that the force that this test charge will feel should be along the line joining the charges, and this force on this one is repulsive? Mm -hmm. Yes, because this is positive test charge and this charge is positive, so the force that this test charge is feeling is along the line joining the two charges from Coulomb's law and it's repulsive this way. Since this is a positive test charge, what did you conclude from this? The, the Right, you can conclude that the direction of electric field, direction of force is the same if Q0 is positive. If this hypothetical thing that you brought is positive, the direction of field must be the same. So that means the direction of E must be the same as force. Now you can forget about your, your test charge, you can remove it. Because that was just a trick to find the direction of electric field. You don't have to have, a, have anything anymore. Now you can answer this question and say, hey, the direction of force, the direction of field that the a test charge on this chalk at located at this point is producing here is this way. How did you figure it out? You used this trick of placing a test charge there and seeing which way to feel a force. And if the test charge was positive, force and field are in the same direction. You can do the same exact thing here, right? Bring the test charge, let's say positive Q0. The direction of force on this positive test charge, will it be repulsive? Due to this one? Yes, since both of them are positive. Force is this way, and we know from this, 
force and field will be in the same direction if the discharge is negative. So that means that the electric field will be exactly this way also. Now we don't need that trick. We can get rid of our test charge. So we can say the direction of electric field produced by this force <coughs> at this location is outwards. Right? Sorry, please. Uh, if, you use the if you use a negative test charge, though, wouldn't it be going in the opposite direction? But let's let's talk about the negative test charge. I'll come back to that in a minute. But no, it'll give you exactly the same answer for the electric field. But do you see a trend? So your question is a super excellent question, and I'm going to answer that in a second. But do you see that uh, there is a trend here? What would be the direction of, if I told you, okay, now tell me what is the electric field here, what is the direction of electric field here, direction of electric field here, what do you see here? It's always pointing radially away from the positive point charge. Do you see that? So any place, one thing that you've learned from here is that if I ask you what's the electric field here due to this point charge, after some time you say, okay, I have understood this trick, I have figured out a trend here, the electric field, I don't even need to put my hypothetical test charge there. I know the electric field at this location produced by this charge is going to be radially away over there. Over here, it's going to be radially away like this. Over here, it's going to be radially away like this. Over here, it's going to be radially away over here, etc., etc. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Now let's answer her question, because that's a really good point. The thing is, what if we use a negative test charge? It does not matter. You can use negative test charge, just that you have to reason about this equation correctly. So let's try, okay? Suppose you ask me, what is the electric field over here? And this time, I'm going to say, I'm going to be brave. I don't care to use positive test charge. Let me use a negative test charge, okay? That's fine. So you have asked me for electric field here. Let's try together to use a negative test charge. So we'll put a negative Q0 here. Which way will the negative Q0 feel a force due to this one? Second row, please. What did you say? Very good. It will be again from Coulomb's law. It will again be along the line joining the two. But this time, negative Q0 is attracted <coughs> towards this positive charge, right? And so it will feel a force this way. Now look at this equation here. This says force is equal to Q0 times E. If Q0 is negative, what can you tell about the direction of force versus direction of field? They should be opposite, shouldn't they? If Q0 is negative, force and field should be opposite. Right? And that would mean, you told me that the force is that way, or minus Q0, that means the field that is produced by plus Q, that is causing this force on Q0, should be this way. Is everybody seeing? Because for a negative test charge, the force and field are opposite. And so, hey, again, my test charge was a trick. Let me get rid of my test charge, let me get rid of the force. Again, I found that the electric field produced by a positive charge is always radially away from it. So regardless of whether you bring a positive test charge or a negative test charge, so long as you inter interpret the relationship between force and field correctly, you will always see that the electric field that is produced by a positive charge, point charge, is always radially away from it. Any questions, folks? Okay. Now, what if the charge for which we were trying to find the electric field was negative? What, what way, which way do you think it will be? So, <clears throat> so suppose I have a negative charge, and I'm asking you, what is the electric field direction at a distance r away from this negative charge? Is everybody convinced that maybe it's just easier for us to bring a positive test charge here? No? It's not, you're not convinced you want to bring negative test charges? It's okay because I, we just saw that the answer is going to be the same regardless of whether we bring positive or negative test charge. Let me show you with both. So if I ask you for the direction of electric field here, what will you do? If you don't know, just bring this hypothetical test charge. Let's try with positive test charge. So here, I put a plus Q0 here in my head. Which way do you think this plus Q0 will feel a force due to this charge? Because we are finding the field produced by this charge at this location. And what is its direction? It should be, is this attracted? 
Yes, it's attracting. So that is the direction of force. Since we chose a positive test charge, is that also going to give us the direction of the field? Yes. And that means that the direction of the electric field that is produced by this charge at this location is going to be this way also. At this point, we don't need the test charge, we don't need the force, because that was just a trick. We just wanted to find what is the field at this location produced by this charge. And you can see it's pointing towards it. Right? We could have done it with a negative test charge also. How? If this was a negative test charge, which way will this feel a force? Huh? Will it be repelled from the negative charge here? Yes. So the force would have been this way. But if since the test charge is negative, you have a minus sign here for Q0. So the field and force are opposite. Right? So do you see that a force in this direction on a negative test charge means a field in that direction that is causing this force. Right? And hence, we come to the same exact conclusion that the field that is produced at this point by a negative point charge is going to be radially towards the negative point charge. Please. So if it's a negative point charge, it's always towards it. If it's a positive point charge, it's always away from it. Excellent. So if it's a negative point charge, the field is always going to be radially inward. If it's a positive point charge, the field is going to be always radially outward. And you can easily test it by bringing a test charge at that location, thinking about which way it will feel a force, and then figuring out what should be the direction of field. So after some time, you'll get so comfortable with this, you will exactly say that, even without bringing test charges all the time, right? Because you got used to it, you now understand that the field will always point radially away from positive, and in this case, radially towards a negative point, negative point charge. So by the way, does everybody understand we don't need this test charge anymore? But again, if I were to do this thing here, I will see that the electric field is radially towards it. Again, if I were to find the electric field here, I will find that the electric field due to this negative charge at this location is radially towards it. <clears throat> at this location, electric field is towards it, etc. So it's all, it's always radially towards it. So the, elect the direction of the electric field that is set up by this negative test charge is always towards it. Now let's figure out what is the magnitude of electric field. Is that hard or easy? Easy. Why is it easy? Let's work on it. Hey, from this relation, we can already see that the magnitude of electric field, sorry, magnitude of force should be equal to the magnitude of charge times the magnitude of electric field. Shouldn't it? So that means the magnitude of electric field should be force magnitude divided by the magnitude of the test charge. And so, Let's think about it one more time. So suppose I wanted to find the field at this location. I brought some test charge, let's say positive, which is plus Q0. And let's say this distance here between these two things is R. R is this distance. What would be the Coulomb force, the magnitude of Coulomb force? Somebody from the last row. What is this force F? What is the magnitude of this force F between this test charge Q0 that I brought here and the charge minus Q whose field I am interested in finding? What is the force between these two? First tell me the force. Coulomb's law, we've been talking for two days. Go ahead, folks. Anybody? Anybody from the last row? Yeah, please. KQ initial Q1 over R squared. Excellent. The force from Coulomb's law between these two charges is going to be K, Q0, Q, divided by the distance between them squared, right? This is, Q is this charge, Q0 is the test charge, divided by R squared, right? This is the force. And notice we are talking about magnitude of force, we don't care about the sign right now. Directions we have already figured out, direction of electric field. We are only now interested in magnitude. Now we have to divide this by Q0. <clears throat> Let's divide this by Q0. Notice Q0 and Q0 get cancelled. What we are left with here is that the magnitude of electric field due to a point charge is <coughs> KQ divided by R squared. 
right? Is it a good thing that there is no Q0 there in the answer? Yeah, it is a good thing because, you know, if I'm telling you that I want to put some ne negative charge minus Q on this chart and I want to know the field here, there is no charge here. I'm just telling you what is the influence of the charge here at this location or at this location or at this location. Test charge was just a trick. You know, so basically, I, I have found the electric field produced by a point charge over here, and it turns out to be k cube over r squared. And notice this magnitude of electric field will work both for positive point charges and negative point charges. Do you see that? Okay. So basically then, what we have found is that What we have found is that the electric field produced by a point charge at a distance r away from it is given by this. So notice that this is the electric field produced by a point charge. Notice this has to be a point charge because later we are going to talk about <coughs> what happens when there are many charges or maybe charge is distributed uniformly on some surface, maybe a disk, then we have to use superposition principle and find the vector sum, right, of the electric field due to all of the charges. This is the electric field due to one point charge at the distance r. Point charge q, let's call it q, at a distance r away. And this magnitude will be the same regardless of whether the charge is negative or positive, the direction of the field for positive is radially away from it or negative is radially towards it. Any questions, folks, about this? Okay, so then guess what I'm thinking next? Superposition principle, right? But before we use superposition principle, let's at least see that if suppose your charge, suppose the charge is, suppose it's a positive charge, and it's 10 power minus 6 Coulomb, if you are one meter away from it, suppose R was equal to one meter, what do you think will be the electric field there? Can we use it? K Q over R squared, right? That's going to be 9 times 10 to the power 9 in SI unit. Q is 10 power minus 6 Coulombs divided by R squared, which in this case happens to be one meter square. So this many, what is the unit of electric field since everything is an SI unit? Very good. It's Newton per Coulomb. And how much is it? Is this? Do you see this is 9 times 10 Q Newton. So this is 9,000 Newton. Oh, sorry, not Newton, Newton per Coulomb. This means that at one, one meter distance away, the electric field produced by a charge which is 10 power minus 6 Coulomb is given by 9,000 Newton per Coulomb. So if suppose I told you, okay, so now I'll bring a test charge here. So let's say that we bring a positive test charge Q0, right, which let's say is 10 power minus 14 Coulomb. And suppose the next part of the question in the exam was asking, find the force on that test charge. What will it be? What is the force on that test charge, anybody? Can we use this? Yes. So we can say that the force, and let's first figure out the magnitude of force on that test charge Q0 is going to be Q0 times E, which is equal to uh, Q0 is 10 to the power minus 14 Coulomb times the electric field there, which is 9,000 newtons per coulomb. And what should be the unit of force? The unit of charge is coulomb. The unit of electric field is newton per coulomb. The unit of force should be newton. So this is the force, right? Is everybody understanding this? So this is the force that you find. What about the direction of force on this? Will it be radially away from it? Yeah, because this is a positive charge. Positive and positives will repel. 
so the force will be radially away from it, what would be the direction of electric field? Will it also be this way because it's radially away from this chart? Yeah, so that's the direction of electric field also, and it makes sense. The direction of electric field and force are in the same, are the same if the test charge is positive. Right? Notice, if suppose this distance was not one meter, but it was two meters, if suppose this thing was two meters, how would the electric field change? Will it be, everything will be the same, this will be two square, right, here in the denominator? So will it become one fourth of this? Yes. If you go <coughs> three meters away, it will become three square here, that means it will become one ninth of this. You see what I'm saying? So electric field will fall off as 1 over r squared as you go farther and farther away from the charge, right, if you're at a distance r away. And notice that if the charge is stronger, if the charge is greater in magnitude, it produces a larger electric field. So electric field magnitude is proportional to charge, right? Okay, at this point I think you understand everything about electric field due to one single point charge. The directions you understand, direction is radially away for, for positive, the direction is radially towards for negative, its magnitude is given by this, we even give an example here to understand this concept. You also understand once you have found the electric field, how you can find the force on some charge you bring there. And remember the advantage I was telling you earlier with many charges. If you change the test charge to say 3 times 10 power minus 14 coulomb, all I have to do is multiply this thing by 3 times 10 power minus 14 and I will get the force on that charge located at that point, right? Now let's use superposition principle to find the electric field due to many charges. We'll go slowly, so let's this time try to find the electric field at this location, maybe due to the charge on that and on something else over here. So. And again, the ideas are very, very similar to what we have discussed for forces. So, so now we are going to talk about electric field due to several. point charges. And as we said, we should use superposition principle. Right? And superposition principle says that the electric field at it should be given by electric field say at the look at some point one is given by E12 plus E13 plus E14 plus E15 dot dot dot. That means electric field at some point is due to the electric field produced by charge 2 at that location, electric field produced by charge 3 at that location, plus electric field produced by charge 4 at that location, plus electric field produced by charge 5 at this location. And when I say plus, this is vector sum, right? Okay. So let's take one example, concrete example here. So suppose we had this problem. <coughs> suppose we had three char the two charges which were in a straight line. And let's say that both of them were positive. So let's say you have some charge here, Q1 which is 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, and then you here you have some charge Q2, which is 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb. And you are asked, find the electric field at this location, okay, which is say at a distance of 2 meters from this charge, and at a distance of 1 meter from this charge. Do you think we can do this? 
yeah, all we have to do is be very systematic and we can use the superposition principle. We can figure out what would be the direction and always find the direction first. Just like in the case of forces, you draw the free body diagrams first, don't you? To figure out what would be the direction of the forces. And then at that point, it just boils down to a problem of vector addition similar to what you had done in physics one. Right? So let's try. Who wants to tell me what would be the direction of the electric field at this point due to this charge plus Q1? Somebody from the last row there, please. Please. So the direction will be uh, in the negative x direction? Okay, remember this charge is positive, right? Mm -hmm. And positive charges, so, so suppose this charge was positive here. <coughs> and I asked you what is the direction of electric field here? Positive charges set up electric fields which are radially away from them. Do you remember they were always away from them? And it was the negative charges that produce fields that are towards them. See, if this is a negative charge, and I'm asking you, what is the field that it produces here? A negative charge will produce an electric field that is very weak towards it, right? But do you see that's a positive charge? So it should be? Go ahead, please. Well, is that due to Q2 or the, the total charge? Because No, let's do it. That's the thing. That's why we are using what is called superposition principle. Let's not try to do everything at the same time. Let's do it one by one and then we'll find the vector sum, right? So tell me, tell me you to both of them slowly. So tell, let's figure out due to Q1. Q1, which way will be the influence of Q1, or the electric field produced by Q1? Very good. So let's, you know, so Q1 will have its influence. Let's call it E1, this way. What about Q2? It's a positive charge also. Which way will Q2 have its electric field at this location? In the negative. In the negative. Why? Because the thing is, both of those charges are positive. And positive charges produce electric fields which are radially away from them, right? Is everybody agreeing with that? At this point, the net electric field is just the vector sum of these, right? So if suppose I choose this, you should always choose a coordinate axis. If I choose this as my positive x direction, does everybody see that the E net <coughs> will be what? Will it be E1 magnitude? minus E2 magnitude. Do you see why I put the minus sign here between the two magnitudes? Because this is in the negative x direction. I chose this to be the positive x direction. Right? Would you say that this is the net electric field? Okay, do we also know the magnitude of the electric field produced by this charge at this location and this charge at this location? Or not? We do, right? That's what we found over here. And we found that the magnitude of electric field is given due to a point charge is this. Magnitude of electric field due to a point charge at a rotation at a distance r away is given by this. So we know exactly what it is. So these P1 magnitude will be K times Q1 magnitude divided by what? This distance square, right? We can give that a name, so we can call that, let's say, yeah, let's call it R1, is a good name. So R1 is two meters, right? This, the distance of this point where we are trying to find the electric field from the charge Q1. Is everybody agreeing that this is R1 square? Similarly, the, what is R2? Can anybody tell me what is R2? Very good, it's one meter, right? Because R2 is really the distance of the point where we are trying to find the electric field. Let's give it a name, point P. Distance of this point P where we are trying to find the next electric field E from charge Q2, that's R2, right? So this will be, so E2 magnitude then is going to be K Q2 divided by R2 squared. What will this be? This will be, at this point, it's just plugging in the number. So K is just 9 times 10 power 9 in the SI system of units. If you like, you can even pull out the K. You see K can be pulled out. And then we just have Q1 divided by R1 squared. Q1 is given to us to be 3 times 10 power minus 6 Coulomb divided by R1 squared, which is yeah, 2 meters squared. Then Q2, which is 5 times 10 power minus 6 Coulomb divided by R2 squared, which is 1 meter squared. And what should be the unit? 
Huh? Very good. It should be Newton or Kuma. Because if you make sure that initially you have converted everything into SI system of units, then your answer will always be an SI system of units. And since we are finding the electric field, it's going to be Newton's per Coulomb. By the way, which of these is more? Tell me which of these is more? What is that number? This is 9 times 10 power minus 10 to the power 9 times what? This is 3 over 4, right? Let's pull out also 10 to the power minus 6. So times 10 to the power minus 6. And then we have 3 over 4 minus what? Five. Minus 5, very good. Minus 5 <coughs> Newton per coulomb. This is our answer. Is this positive or negative? Mm -hmm. You can see it's negative because 3 fourths is less than minus less than 5, right? And so this number is going to be a negative number. What does that tell you about the direction of electric field? Somebody from the fourth row here. Which way is the electric field? Negative x direction or positive x direction? Very good. It's going to be the fact that this is negative, you know, this thing is negative. And this means that E points in negative x direction. Right, negative x direction. Yes, because we had to find the magnitude of electric field and the direction of electric field both because we are looking for a vector, right? Electric field is a vector. And we did find the magnitude, here it is, and the fact that it turned out to be negative, negative we, we know this means it's in the negative x direction. Right? This is a one dimensional problem. Okay, now here is a question that I want all of you to be thinking with somebody. <coughs> about, this is another question, example two. The question is this. <clears throat> if suppose you have two positive charges, right? Plus, you know, that's it, you have two charges, plus Q1 and plus Q2, exactly the situation that you have over there, this one is three times 10 to the power minus six Coulomb, and this one is 5 times 10 to the power minus 6 plus 1. And then you have another situation, and let the distance between the two charges be exactly the same. This one is 3 meters. The question that I have for you is, is there a point between the two charges, on the straight line joining the two charges, somewhere where the net electric field is completely zero? That means there is no electric field at all. That's the question for you. Take one minute, talk to a person next to you. So the question is, is there a point somewhere here? charges, if you look at different points here or here or here or here, the electric field due to 
Q1 and the electric field into Q2 point in opposite directions, right? And so there, there must be some point in between where the fields actually cancel each other out completely, right? If the two charges, so that's a very good point. Now, if the two charges were exactly equal in magnitude, suppose this, that was 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb and this was 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, would the answer be easy to find where the electric field would be zero? So if this was also 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, where would the point be? At midpoint, right? Because you could say, hey, I know that electric field due to each point charge is, has the same magnitude k, q, q is this, q are the same, this is 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, this is 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb, and the distance r must be the same if we want e1 to be equal to e2 in magnitude, right? Wouldn't you say that? But what if they are not equal in magnitude, and let's consider the original case, 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb. Then, you expect that point between those two charges to be closer to which charge? The stronger one or the weaker one? Go ahead, please. Closer to the one to the left because the one to the right has a stronger. Um, uh. Very good. If you wanted to find a point where you cancel the influence of this charge and this charge, and this charge is weaker than this one, he's absolutely correct. This the point better be closer to the weaker charge. Only then can the weaker charge cancel its influence with that of the stronger charge, right? Because there are two things in electric field. There is the magnitude of charge, and there's also this distance factor. So suppose you're asked to find, if there is a point, if so, which we figured out, yes, there is, find the point, find the location. So at this point, if we wanted to find the location of the point, you, you, you guys have already figured out it should be closer to this charge, right? Let's choose some something. Let's call, let's say that it's here. Let's say that the point P, where the electric field turns out to be equal to zero, is at a distance x away from the from this charge here. If this is a distance x away, how much would be the distance from this charge? Yeah, that would be 3 minus x. 3 meters minus x. All of this is an SI unit. So basically what we are saying is, let that point P be P. Notice that E, whenever you say E, electric field, this is also true for the rotation in your book, it always means the net electric field. You know, you should always understand this to be E net, even though it will not be written explicitly. Whenever <coughs> the question is saying find the electric field, it means the net electric field due to all the charges, right? And then you have to find the vector sum. So the place where this is equal to zero, be a distance x away, from Q1. So then, what we have is, again, just like on the top, in the top question, which way is the electric field at this point, P, due to Q1? Notice there, E1 is pointing. That way, right? Which way is the electric field due to this positive charge at this location? Remember, due to positive charge, the electric field is always pointing radially away from it. So if I ask you which way is the electric field at this point due to this, you say radially away, radially away, radially away. Now I'm asking over here, it'll be radially away, right? So do you see that E2 at the point where we are interested, which is over here, should be that way? Everybody with me? Okay. So then, again, if we choose this to be our x direction, our E net will be E1, which is in the positive x direction, minus E2. So you can see that this is going to be, you know, E1 minus E2. And <clears throat> this and this should be equal to zero for us because we want this thing to be equal to zero. So this means that the magnitude of E1 should be equal to the magnitude of E2. Right? Is everybody seeing? If the E net, which 
is e1 minus e2 magnitude is 0 at that point, e1 and e2 must have equal magnitude if I take this to the other side. Right? All right. Do we know the magnitudes of each of these? Yeah, we do. Because <coughs> that's what we just now figured out. We said that each of these point charges produce an electric field that is kq over r square. Isn't that the magnitude? So what we are saying is E1 magnitude is equal to E2 magnitude. But E1 is k times q1 divided by what distance square? Yeah, the distance of q1 from the point where we are saying the electric field is 0. That is x. And that's what we are looking for. We want to know what is x. That's what the question is asking. And E2 is k magnitude of q2 divided by which distance square? <coughs> Very good. The distance of this point where we want to find the electric field equal to 0 from the charge q2. This is 3 meters minus x meters square. I can divide both sides by k and k get cancelled, gets cancelled, right? So what I get then is q1 magnitude times 3 minus x squared is equal to q2 magnitude times x squared. And notice, at this point it's just algebra, isn't it? We are done with physics. At this point, if you gave it to your brother who's just learning algebra, he probably would be able, or sister, your brother or sister would be able to do it for you. So let's plug in the numbers and see what we get. Q1 is given to us to be 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb. 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb. And we have 3 minus x squared. This should be equal to Q2, which is 5 times 10, 5 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb times x squared. Notice, can I divide both sides by 10 power minus 6? Yeah, I can divide both sides by 10 power minus 6. This gets cancelled. So what we are left with then is, this is 3 times 3 times 3 minus x squared is equal to 5 <coughs> x squared. I could have chosen my numbers to be prettier, but that's all right. So the thing is, one thing we can do is we can take the square root of both sides, right? If we take the square root of, or let's first do this. This is equal to 5 over 3 x squared, right? Let's take square root of both sides, then we get 3 minus x is equal to square root 5 over 3 x. Or from here, what do we find? 3 is equal to square root 5 over 3 x plus x. Right? Is everybody with me? And what this also says, let me just write it over here. From there we can see that 3 meters is equal to square root 5 over 3 plus 1 times x. <coughs> or x, the thing that we are looking for is 3 divided by <coughs> square root 5 over 3 plus 1. So this many meters. Have we found the answer? Yeah. So this is the distance from the charge q1. So the distance of the point where the electric field is 0 is this many meters away from Q1. Right? If you, for example, if you decided to find the distance, if you decided to call this x and call this C minus x, that would have been fine too, but then your x would have turned out to be, you know, not the same as my x, that would have been 3 minus what I found, right? Is that making sense? But either way is fine. You should show clearly in picture what you mean. Have a great weekend. Professor Singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. For more information about Professor Singh and her research, visit our website in the description below.